Welcome everyone for tonight's talk show, the Transport Talk Show from COP23 here in Bonn, Germany. We're very pleased to have a great live audience and, and all of you out in the internet world are joining us. Um, we're here at the DHL headquarters in Post Tower, so thanks so much for them for hosting us, as well as PPMC, the Paris Process on Mobility and Climate, which is an initiative uh, co-organized by Slowcat and by Michelin's Moving On. Um, tonight's theme, every night this week and next week we're having different themes. Tonight's theme is um, e-mobility and innovation. So we're going to be exploring the opportunities and the challenges that are in the uh, trends that are occurring right now to, ch to tackle the climate change challenge and sustainability. Before we really dive into this with our amazing guests tonight, um, some housekeeping rules. Those of you in the audience, if you don't mind uh, silencing your phones, I think you were asked to do that already. And those of you in the internet world, please uh, feel free to send in questions to hashtag we are transit. Um, or sorry, we are transport. We hashtag spent so many days doing this. I don't know. We are the world. We are transport. So we are transport. Hashtag we are transport. And also our team is moderating the Facebook page. So I think there's a chat box open there that you can also send in questions. Um, at the very end of tonight's show, we'll have an opportunity to answer some of those questions. Um, so, so we are here with our first great guest uh, of four, um, Sandra Rowling from EV100, Electric Vehicles 400, but we'll have her explain that. Um, so I'd like to hear just before we kind of dive into EV100, uh, maybe you can explain a little bit to the audience about, you know, what you're doing here at COP23. Yes, absolutely. So EV100 is our corporate leadership initiative um, that the Climate Group started to drive uh, climate action in the field of electromobility. And I think the reason that we're really um, here is to demonstrate what companies are already doing on electromobility to show what is possible, that electric vehicles are really on the way to becoming the new normal, and through that also then inspire policymakers to be more ambitious in what they're doing here in the Excellent. negotiations. And there's plenty of policymakers here, so this is the place to be doing that. Um, right now excellent so EV100 um, maybe people have heard of RE100 renewable energy 100 uh, but EV100 can you just give us the breakdown what is it the framework Yes, so it's about bringing together a network of companies that are committed to electromobility and that have made public commitments to transition their fleets to electric vehicles and or to roll out charging infrastructure for their staff and their customers by 2030. So it's deliberately a very ambitious target and it's really about demonstrating what is possible at this stage and bringing a great group of companies together to support that message. Um, we launched a month, two months actually by now ago at Climate Week in September, and we now have 14 big international companies already on board, so that's, we're really excited. That's great. Okay, so to break that down, because there's a lot in there. So Climate Week, by the way, is a one le week long series of events in New York City around the launching of the General Assembly of the United Nations, where a lot of activity happens to support climate action. That's where you launched, so that was yes. just a short while ago, and you already have 14 companies on board. Um, that's fantastic. Congratulations. And the, the, the two sort of general commitments are one that electric fleets that they, that they hire or that they're their own have to be electric or they have to provide charging stations, if you will, just to, in lay speak, because not everyone's a transport yes, expert here. Yes, exactly. Uh, charging stations for either their staff or their um, consumer, consumers, customers everywhere their offices are, everywhere their businesses? That's that the idea, yes. It's a okay, global commitment, okay. so it's obviously being at the front line of okay. leadership, if you Great. will, on electromobility. Great. And then it's a CEO level sort of commitment. So what is the value of having these companies do this? I mean, why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a number of, of, of different reasons, really, why companies mm -hmm. are doing it. But I think at the sort of largest level, it's about being leaders on climate action. And it's also about preparing for the future. So, um, you know, a number of different themes that our companies are looking at is um, air pollution, for example. That's a huge issue that is coming up in lots of international cities. Mexico, Beijing, London are all cities that are already looking at ways to curb emissions. And companies like Deutsche Post DHL, for example, which are one of our first joiners for the initiative, they want to be part of that solution. Um, another mm -hmm. example are companies like IKEA, who know that their customers really expect them to be responsible companies to do their bit, to do the right thing. So they're putting charging infrastructure and they're now also looking into transitioning their furniture delivery into electric vehicles to 
basically be a responsible citizen and show their customers what Excellent. can be done. And uh, you might have missed this, but the other night we had a representative from the youth community talking about how important it was to their generation to have, to be aware of what their, um, you know, who they purchased from, all of the different companies, what, how green they were, and truly green, transparently green. So, so that's quite important uh, to, to many consumers, but increasingly to the young demographic and, and surveys, it's been proven. Um, so can, can we tease that out a little bit more? So it's great they're making these pledges, and what sort of is the vision for long-term, accountability is a heavy word, but how does it work within the organization about them proving that they're doing this or, or, or working towards doing it? Yeah, so the companies are making the commitment to us. They're saying publicly we're going to make this transition by 2030. Then each company can develop its own roadmap and set milestones, etc. So really work out how they're going to get there. Decide maybe, you know, some of the low hanging fruits um, to tackle first. And then what are some of the harder things they will do a little bit further down the line. And then we have an annual reporting cycle as well. Um, where we're asking companies once a year what's the progress they have made so that we can hold them to account and also tell the story about how collectively in the, the initiative has really been moving forward and what the impact is that we've been able to make. Excellent, excellent. And so you're working with, um, so th it's a collaborative effort. Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of conversation with the companies. They, they select the milestones they decide what, what, at what pace they can deliver against this by 2030. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Each it, company what was the up. reasoning behind 2030? Um, it was really about setting an ambitious target that is possible for companies. It does give them 10, 12 years um, to work towards the target so they don't need to make all the investments right now. They can factor in you know, fleet renewal cycles and other types of things that they have already set up. But at the same time, it's also about showing that we can make the transition faster than maybe some people currently would expect. I think we've been seeing a lot of momentum on electromobility. We've seen a lot of, you know, people upgrading their expectations for how fast the process can go. And we really want to contribute to that and say, here's a group of companies that are already ready to make the transition that leave this will be happening. And they think they can do it by 2030. Yeah, that's great. There has been a an in, in increasing exponentially, uh, exponential curve of electric commitments to electric mobility in the last couple of years. So it makes sense that, yeah, that's a reasonable approach, right? Yeah. Um, and so you're working with the climate group in particular? Uh, yes, well, the climate yeah. group is the organization that, that is running They're EV100. Launching. So mm -hmm. it's sort of part of our the mission to, to drive climate action, really. And it's okay. sort of a bit of our specialty, bringing the leaders together to drive change. As you mentioned with RE100, that's our renewables initiative. They already have over 100 companies involved now. And collectively, their that's energy fantastic. demand is as large as Poland. So, you know, it's really a good example of showing that if you bring all this individual leadership together, you can get to a global impact. That's, that's really fantastic. So the RE100 was a fantastic model that this was sort of based, mm -hmm. based yeah. upon. Yeah. And um, you're at 14 now and you're expecting, do you have sort of a trajectory or a, um, what you're planning or hoping to, to scale up to or? Um, yeah, so I, th I think it's an organic process. We started with 10 to, you know, really yeah. demonstrate the level of ambition, yeah. the types of companies that we want. And a few joined today. Exactly. Is Just that right? this morning we got yeah. four more, two from New Zealand, Air New Zealand and Mercury, a new company, our first joiner from Japan, Aeon Mall, and also Royal Huskoning, which is one of the Dutch leading companies who've already worked a lot on transitioning their fleets. So we're really, That's we're great. having these conversations with companies one-on-one -on -one as we go along, and the idea is really to keep bringing additional commitments out and with each of those obviously also having the opportunity to tell a new story about what companies are doing why they're doing it and what also the business case is for doing it that's fantastic and um, and transparency bigs is a big part of this right this is a very public yeah. campaign yeah. it's about sharing the information they get something out of it as well I imagine by basically learning from each other and, and, and so there's some information sharing for the companies yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. That's an opportunity to learn from each other, share experiences between different geographies, for example, between different industries, sometimes also being able to maybe solve problems together and also just being very public and, you know, talking about electromobility as a technology that they believe is here now and That's viable. happy to be leaders Because I think just a few years ago, there's a lot of skepticism about electric mobility, where the charging stations, can you go 50 miles, 100 miles before the car peters out, et cetera. And I think we're really starting to change that dialogue. So uh, that's fantastic if you see these large corporations saying, look, our entire fleet is dependent on delivering your goods. 
with this electric vehicle, we're relying on it. You know, that's a that sends a strong signal to the market yeah. that um, that technology is changing, capacity's there. It's time to move. Yeah. So yeah. that that's I think it's a fantastic initiative at the right time. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I approve. I hope others <laughs> approve. I think it's great. Um, uh, so I, one more question, like, okay, you've, I think you've really said why is it important to bring mm -hmm. here for policymakers, but, um, and of course, because the global audience, we're, there's 20,000 people plus here, and hopefully we're reaching more people out there in the ether, but is there any other reason that you uh, wanted to talk about being here at COP besides maybe celebrating the four that announced, or? Um, no, I think it's it's sort of, I mean, over the last few years, we've really seen the non-state actor agenda becoming a much bigger part of the COP negotiations. And I think it's really about being here and saying businesses are also there to lead on electromobility and obviously also on other topics through the actions that they're doing on innovation, on changing their processes. They're directly contributing to the targets that have already set been set. But we also want to encourage policymakers then to be even more ambitious and to see that electromobility is really something that also has business support and that. Is, is possible for them Great. to work on. Great, yeah, this is the place to do that, so sends, sends the right signal. Um, everyone is receiving the same question at the end. I, um, I think I prepared you for this. So, uh, and then remember that you can't answer, there's no silver bullet, you have to have one answer. And so, um, uh, what, what would you say in your area of field, or you can get out of it if you want, but um, is a singular, concise, pragmatic step that can transform the uh, transportation sector right now? Something for us or for the larger community? Either. I think for, for us, maybe for everyone out there, go find an electric vehicle and drive it, because I think one of the things that we're hearing from everyone is once you get into one, it is actually very exciting and it is a better technology, so maybe that's the first step towards then convincing a larger group to, to give it a try on larger scale as well. Excellent. Thank you, wonderful. So please stay here. Um, thanks so much for, for joining us today. But uh, before we transition, uh, we have uh, our team, Nicola in particular, thank him so much for going out and interviewing views from the street. We, we have been um, uh, tackling COP participants to see what their views are about sustainable transport. And we heard from two. They are, uh, I want to say Vanessa from Australia. This is going from memory. And Yellen. Yulin from Mexico. I wrote the card, I can't remember. Forgive me if I said it wrong. But we're going to hear from them right now, views from the street, what they think about sustainable transport. Sustainable transport. Well, to me, I think it means uh, having transport systems that can help people meet their mobility needs, help them move around, but in a way that is also friendly to the environment. Uh, I think uh, transportation, uh, everyone knows it's important, but it hasn't really taken the priority that I, I believe it needs. Uh, and since I believe cities have a lot to do with climate change in general, uh, I hope transportation is recognized as one of the key elements to, to really improve the, the, reduce the emissions in the cities and, and with that in general, and to really make a change in an efficient way and, and sustainable way. Welcome back. I want to make sure I said their names correctly. That was Vanessa from Australia and Soyal from Me Mexico. And I believe one or both are in the audience tonight. So thanks so much for coming. All right, so our next three panelists. Thanks so much for coming, ladies. And yes, you are seeing it correctly. This is an all-women's panel. I think this might be the first time in transport history that we have <laughs> an all-women's panel. I wore pink to celebrate. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we actually did. We had, a, That's done, then. we had a celebratory <laughs> photograph earlier. Somebody actually recorded it in history. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have Sheila Watson from the FIA Foundation, and we have Yen, please print, Van, Van from the China Sustainable Transport uh, Center, and uh, Margot. Thank you so much from EY, <laughs> formerly known as Ernst & Young. So I don't pretend to be able to pronounce everyone's name. Um, Sheila, we're going to start with you and, uh, and then go around. Um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, so Sheila, you, you wear a few hats um, and you have a few initiatives that are critical and innovative and really driving 
a lot of great work. Thank you. Um, so why don't we tackle them a bit one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, I know you in the past were working on this 104 50 by 50 initiative, and I understand yeah. it's really been ramping up in the last few years. Yeah. For people who don't know what it is, can you explain what of it is course. and how it's been doing? So basically, I run an initiative, which is a partnership of a lot of very expert organizations, such as the International Energy Agency and, and so on. And we focus very much on trying to improve the fuel efficiency of internal combustion engine vehicles, light duty vehicles. Uh, it sounds like something that somebody somewhere must be doing. Actually, <laughs> no one's doing it. And if we can't do that, then it's somewhat challenging to imagine how we do the, the other things. Vast amounts of CO2 going up into the sky that don't need to from fuel that's not being used. Uh, the fuel that's uh, being used that doesn't need to be used, forgive me. Um, and so at COP21, uh, because we work with countries, we capacity build work with countries, we encourage and show how to take the steps towards achieving these CO2 gains, um, we decided that we would make a pledge. Uh, and so we pledged at COP21 to get 100 countries to work towards our target. And our target is that you can halve fuel use on average in every vehicle using existing technologies. And I'm proud to say that since COP21, we've trebled the number of countries in, in which we're working. So, so that's what we're here at COP23 to say. So you have how many now? Nearly we have 70. Nearly 70. So you had uh, less than 20, 20 some so, two years yeah. ago. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And really, this is about efficiency. Totally. This is just about efficiency. And when you absolutely. look at the climate equation, I mean, one of the best ways that we can meet it are actually t efficiency gains. Yeah. So it's super practical. And as totally. you mentioned, technology's there now. Totally, totally. That's fantastic. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. Good work. And this thank is mostly you. related to light passenger vehicles. Is that correct? The, it it the is. 100. Okay. It is. It so is. you can imagine my next question. I think I can guess. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah, about heavy-duty vehicles? And yes. maybe you can describe to people who don't know the difference between what is a light-duty vehicle and heavy-duty vehicle, just to make sure we're... Okay, well, technically I'm sure there's some very, very significant distinction, but largely it comes down to light-duty being cars and the small vans that you see on the streets and heavy-duty being large trucks. Um, and the challenges between those two types of vehicles are actually very different. But tomorrow, uh, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative, which has traditionally worked on light duty, is launching our heavy duty uh, vehicle initiative. We believe the same principles apply. We've conducted a great deal of research and thought long and hard. And we've concluded that just as we have 50 by 50, 50 by 30 actually for all new vehicles on the light duty side. So now we're going to have 35 by 35 for heavy duty, we believe that's achievable, so and we're going to offer support to countries to achieve it. Okay, so you're increasing, translate it to the lays, so yeah. increasing efficiency by 35% by, by 2035. 2035. Yeah. And is the, why those equations, why those numbers? Just so practicality, urgency? It comes down to several things. A key thing is existing technology. Another key element in the work that we've done is looking at what's already been done, being done around the world in terms of regulation and so on. Heavy duty is a little bit behind light duty. Uh, I think it is uh, the head of IEA who said, you know, they're heading as a sector, the heavy duty sector, to be using 40% of our oil, and yet they're very neglected in terms of fuel efficiency. But yeah. actually, it comes to your point. Sadly, efficiency is often neglected. It is so often neglected because yeah. it's not. A you know, I, it's not attractive. Like, oh, oh efficiency. I want we the do new. Our best. You know, yeah. You know, no, but it is. Yeah, it's really. It's, true. it's yeah. like you know, everyone wants a new shiny gadget that does other things mm. than efficiency, even with yeah. buildings, etc. It's a struggling it um, issue, although it really is where we can have great ga gains. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about the, you know, passenger vehicles are going up, you know, due, mm. to, due to consumerism and, and mm. new market shares that are growing in certain uh, sectors or certain parts of the world. Um, is that the same for heavy duty? I, I generally don't know. Is that the same for heavy duty it vehicles? It is, yes. Heavy duty, the sector is growing and the use of oil, as I said, is growing. So it's going to be huge, but it's already huge and growing. Um, yeah. so so yes, it's okay. reflecting GDP growth, it's reflecting the increasing um, wealth and desire to access commodities and goods around the world. Okay. Um, but what's interesting, it's a challenge for all of us. I mean, it's actually not one of those things where you can point just to some countries. These are activities which everyone needs to Everybody, embrace. Yeah. We're yeah. all reliant on the delivery of goods that are Indeed. typically in heavy duty vehicles. And Indeed. that's actually related to the last in, um, person who spoke about, it's great these companies that are pledging to use electric vehicles for their freight, for their 
uh, consumer, et cetera, of for course. delivery. Um, do you want to touch on diesel a bit? Because I think I heard you mention so it maybe. Again, Tracy, it's so funny you should mention so that. Funny. So yes. funny. Yes. <laughs> Never knowingly <laughs> under active activity <laughs> at the FIA Foundation. How we do always I have know something. It's, it's so funny. I have in my hand another piece ah. of paper. <laughs> no idea how that happened. Yes, so we're launched. Well, we have launched, and I won't spend too long on it, but we've launched a new initiative called the Real Urban Emissions Initiative, ah. which is true. Okay. And the, 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 the secrets in the title, it all relates to the fact that on road, vehicles use more fuel and they emit more NOx, the yeah. poisonous gases and particles, than they say they do in tests. And this was exposed through the diesel gate uh, in, uh, uh, diesel event gate. in North in North America. It, we knew it was happening. Everybody knew, knew that was happening. And the True Initiative will um, do real world testing. So we are working with London right now in London. We are testing vehicles on the road. We will have about a million data points by the time we do the testing and join with other work. And that is innovative research. It's new. It's a new way of doing things. It's real roadside testing of, of real vehicles. And before we move on, I have to ask a pop question. Is the evidence that, the, the, the data points that are coming from this, is this being, are, is this collaborative with the companies and then shared with the companies and then the consumer world? Or is it just you, you taking their models, testing them and then with the consumer? Well, we're not taking the models, we're testing them on the roads. We're doing it with London and Paris to inform consumer choice. Okay. But we're going to show it to the manufacturers, and the key word here is transparency. If you go back to Dieselgate, that was all about not doing not what you said you were doing yes. and not being transparent. The True Initiative is all about transparency. Love it. This is so good. Okay, I'm going to... I'm sure you have more to say. We're going to go back to your, um, <laughs> what we're asking everybody, so you have time to think about that. Think. Your single I question. Will ponder. Okay, Yen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, so, from the China Sustainable Transport Center, you're doing quite a bit. Um, but maybe before we dive into that in particular, can ev everyone hear just a tiny bit about what you're actually doing here in COP23? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm from CSTC, working in China. We are a domestic NGO and uh, we work on transforming the urban forms and the transportation into more sustainable forms and uh, transition from super blocks uh, to open community and the small grid, a more people-friendly street, and more transit-oriented development. So I'm here to share and uh, also to learn from people to communicate and uh, help uh, China, uh, one of these, the most uh, fast uh, developed the uh, urbanization society to going down to a more sustainable road. A absolutely, and, and everyone hears a lot about China's development and, and if they've been there, they've experienced it. Uh, um, and we talked a bit about the rapid development of different communities and whatnot. Yes. So CSTC is the acronym for China Sustainable Transport Center. Um, just so everyone's connecting the dots. Yes, we get make it a short. We get acronym uh, heavy here. Um, so, so you explained it really well in, in short, that that's what you're doing here and that's what the NGO is about. And um, I, I think you'd ex we talked earlier that you work really closely with the government in particular on yes. um, kind of on legislation, if you will, or policy design. Um, Can you actually, the approach is uh, we first uh, work with other NGOs mm -hmm. and also working with the international teams uh, who brought the, the best idea and uh, connecting them with the local government and the local design institute to make a pilot project to make those uh, more sustainable practice to be realized uh, through the pilot projects and uh, then work on capacity building and the training to scale it up, and uh, finally, working with the different uh, level of a government to make it uh, institutionalized. Excellent, and, and it was recently institutionalized in sort of a policy, I think you yes. mentioned, that was to make sure, what did you call them, super, super blocks would be um, abandoned, or? Yes, uh, actually, uh, um, in China's uh, fast development in urbanization, the, um, Super block, urban sprawl had been the major problem, and also the very fast urban, the very fast uh, motorization 
uh, the super traffic congestion, the non-humanized streets had been a major, major problem. These also cause a lot of uh, congestions and uh, carbon emissions. So our work is to help the country finally change from the super block and the close the society to more open community and uh, small skills and the uh, urban renewals and uh, uh, not uh, more urban sprawl anymore. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's the work uh, we are very proud of. And, and can, that's excellent. And can you, the, the sort of people friendly street or the complete street, can you describe what that might look like in a, in a, in a neighborhood? Ah, uh, yes. In China. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or, or specifically in one of the uh -huh. communities you're Normally, in. when we build a street, uh, we think about a car lane, uh, the sidewalks, and uh, the bicycle lane. But uh, for every street is a public space, uh, we make it into 24 components, depending on which is the street function. So we might have, we work on the facade to facade as a complete street. From the facade format to the open facade to the, um, uh, the street furniture, to the trees, to the landscapes, and uh, to the uh, possibly uh, coffee, and uh, the seating areas, the kids play areas. And in China, we have a uh, lot of uh, elderly they want to do street dance. So we provide all of these to make the street a public space and a complete street to serve people better. That, that, that's fantastic. I think I mean, we were talking in the last few days about that transportation needs to, um, the, se the ministers and the sector needs to be communicating with all of these other ministries yes. to make sure that it's actually delivering uh, service, delivering transportation for services and for a holistic community experience. Yes. And that's such a great example of actually doing it. So um, I think it's really fantastic. Um, do, you, do you feel like there's um, any uh, challenges or opportunity, any, anything else you want to add to sort of like what is lessons learned in this process that you can share with uh, others? Lessons learned, it's very easy to think about a city just to hold the functions to develop a GDP very fast. You can uh, forget uh, what we're building the city for. Are we inviting more cars or are we inviting more people to live in the city, to enjoy the city? So this is the problems we the challenges we might face, and uh, we also have to uh, find uh, the proper approach to overcome it. Thank you, that's excellent. So you're, you're also not off the hook yet, because I'm gonna come back to you after sure. Margot for your final question. Thank you so much for that though. Margot, welcome. Yes. So from EY, which was again once Ernst & Young. Yes. Um, uh, before we get into sort of, I think the open lab and what you've really been doing here, the big picture, mm -hmm. can you just say a little bit about a little bit about what you're here for COP23. Sure, well first thank you for welcoming us here yeah. on stage. Um, so within the climate change and sustainability team at EY we work a lot with governments, investors and companies on how to implement strategies and include the climate in their strategies. And this is one of the reasons why we're here, is to hear about governments, investors and private companies that are willing to contribute to a cleaner future. And within this work, we work specifically on the transport sector um, within the frame of moving on and with the open lab of Michelin. Uh, and we've been facilitating a community uh, about uh, what can be the contribution of the transport sector to a well below two degree scenario. And we've been working on this community for over a year now and specifically tonight I'm representing this community. Excellent. And um, maybe for those of us, so the, um, you're a significant contributor to the Open Lab mm -hmm. initiative or ex maybe you can explain it far better than I sure. that Michelin and, and Moving On uh, initiative is about. Can you explain that and maybe what your recent uh, contribution yeah. has been? Of course. Um, yeah, so the Open Lab facilitates a number of communities and we EY are specifically involved in this one. And uh, we have members from across the whole value chain of the transport sector, which 
to name a few, include DHL, who's hosting us tonight, but also uh, Total, NG, um, and others um, that are really contributing to our work. And we have been um, facilitating a number of workshops together, aiming at identifying which can be uh, key solutions that can really be activated very quickly. We're looking at a very short term. Um, and trying to be really action-oriented um, to be implemented and contribute uh, to reducing the emissions of the sector. So maybe to be a bit more uh, concrete. Yeah, what are some um, specifics that yes. you're proposing? Yeah. Well, we have, obviously we have solutions such as alternative fuels that will have a global impact, uh, but these ones are part of our roadmap, but they also will be scaled up and unlock their full potential in the rather medium term as they request a lot of capital investment and a lot of infrastructure. So we do have messages about that to make sure that decision makers work together with the business sector and provide the right infrastructure. But we do also shed light on other solutions that are more... Um, oriented to foster societal and behavioral change. And uh, I'm talking, for instance, about having programs to train people to have environmentally friendly driving, which can uh, reduce from 6% to 25% the fuel consumption. Um, and also, for instance, integrating short distance carpooling to our transport systems, making these options visible and comparable to your usual solo driving um, habits. And the last one that we're working on is implementing regional financial incentive schemes that uh, reward commuters to cancel their trip, for instance, working from home, but also carpooling or um, shifting to the train. Anyway, reducing the demand for mobility at a given time and specifically during peak hour. Excellent. So, did um, before I would love to hear a little bit more about a couple of these. Um, these came from workshops that you kind of held with these different parts of that was the yes. open lab idea was yeah, to get these absolutely. practitioners together and really mm -hmm. and um so the the first one uh, these are all behavioral changes or like sort of immediate ways of changing the yeah. first one really intrigues me but sort of uh, educating and training people to make mm -hmm. personal decisions that are different um because we talk a lot about in, in, um, in, uh, institutionalized changes and uh you know making choices available to the consumer, but at some point, really, the consumers and people have to change. Yeah. So can you touch upon the first one a bit with the training? Is it yeah. how? Of course. <laughs> well, um, they're actually, for environmentally friendly driving, you have several solutions, and you can be from I said 6% reduction is if you have embarked software in a car that is like cruise control, tells you which uh, speed you shouldn't um, go over. But um, the training is for some countries like Sweden, for instance, have made compulsory uh, for everyone when you're uh, training to get your driver's license to have an environmentally fr friendly driving training. And this is not the case everywhere. And it, uh, it can actually unlock a, a lot of emission savings up to 25%. Um, and then you have, if you go even further in the embarked software, for instance, um, we have what we call gamification. So it's actually encouraging the driver to have a really good driving practice by rewarding him with points for like um, extra fuel um, um, you know, discounts or things like that. And this is where I'm saying that the business sector and the public sector are really, should really work together because the training programs should be um, you know, encouraged by the the, uh, private, the public sector, for instance. Absolutely, that's excellent. And uh, it's interesting because I think, you know, based on studies about youth who will be trained to become the next drivers, mm -hmm. they are very responsive to being sustainable. And I'm, I'm sure if they knew what was a sustainable choice, they'd be yeah. more likely to take it. And that's the right, the right time to, yeah. to, be, uh, to inform them. So that's totally. a great one. Um, we're a little pressed for time, but can you quickly talk about maybe the third one? Because that sounds a little like how to get people to actually stay, you know, I'm sure yeah. lots of people like to stay home, but get people to stay home. Again, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why we really need collaboration between the private and public sector, because if you want people to be able to work from home or to commute outside of peak hours, it means that the big employers in the locality need to enable their employees to have this flexibility. 
Um, but basically how it works is that the consortium, the companies that own or operate highways, for instance, are able to control the way um, the traffic goes and we can monitor um, the number of cars that, that are um, rolling at a, at a given time. Uh, and the public sector is able to say, okay, so outside of these 20,000 cars, we involve these people in the program and we offer, say, two euros uh, to each person who is not taking their car at this given moment, say between 7.30 and 9.30 when it's peak hour. Uh, and you're able to monitor this because of the highway uh, monitoring facilities. Interesting, interesting, great. And um, I, I recall you saying earlier in your, in your conversation that all of this is sort of practical that can happen right now. Yeah. Like that's what's... Yes, totally. Well, one of the main, uh, you know, interests in uh, working on these solutions is that they are not very capital intensive when you compare it to investing in infrastructure. And they also rely on technologies that are already in place, that are widely available. Um, so there is no cost related to developing the technology. It's yeah. just about getting the right stakeholders working together, uh, having the right incentives, and having access to data. And really, that's really, really important. Really important, yeah, very good points. Um, all right, so we're gonna do the, um, if you if you wanna spend some time talking uh, to, you know, figuring out, making comments to each other, but uh, let's maybe um, see if there's some questions from the audience or from Twitter. Um, and then uh, remember, it's hashtag we are transport. And we are the world, but we're also transport. Hashtag we are. <laughs> and um, before we take this, let's do our last question. That's the official one. One, two, three. And it is, in your area of work, what is a um, uh, specific pragmatic action that can be taken to transform the transport sector right now? Sheila. So we have to act now to get existing technologies just as you said, Margot, into every vehicle and every heavy duty vehicle that will help them to be as efficient as they possibly can be. Ta da! <laughs> Yen. Make the city and the street more people friendly. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'd say have governments enact the right regulatory standards, either embark software for environmentally friendly driving or eco driving training programs when you get your driver's license. Excellent. Super practical. Oh, gosh, why aren't we doing this Nothing all right now? Practical. I'm almost getting depressed this isn't happening right now. Okay. Let's do this, guys. Come on. All of you ladies and gentlemen in the government. All right, let's do this. All right, so Twitter is asking us. Um, oh, interesting. If city politicians want to incentivize local businesses to use public transport and bikes instead of cars, what are tried and successful measures? Can we answer this amongst us? Bicycle, if they want to incentivize public transport and bike use, incentivize it, what are um, tried, true, successful measures? Maybe, maybe we can go to you first since um, we know bicycle use is so popular mm -hmm. and you are all about community streets. Mm. Do you have any? Yes. Um, the government, uh, first of all, needs to provide uh, the right facilities for to make transit and a bike and a, uh, walking more friendly. This is the first step. And uh, especially um, give priority to public transit, uh, give it a right of way, making designated bus lane and a good bus network to make it more attractive to build subways. And also um, to initial to uh, motivate people to use them, uh, you have to have the you kind of have to penalize the car usage and uh, give a, a more economic usage of the transit system and uh, bike and walking. Very good point. Very good point. We um, any other comments on that? Yeah. I'd add that um, infrastructure is a priority, but and as Yen say, uh, you, you, it's hard to penalize the people who are using their cars, but it's, um, it's easy to provide the right positive incentives to trigger uh, voluntary behavioral, behavioral change. As I said, like, actually in, in France, some companies subsidize the use of public transport, and uh, the, if you buy a bike, then you also get a subsidy for your company or from the government. So it's not about penalizing, it's also about 
encouraging people who are doing the right thing, and, and that's more sustainable as a behavior change. That's a good point. And some I uh, agree with you as uh, my own NGO, none of us drive because uh, we provide uh, 20 RMB per day for using public transit or walking. And if you drive, you pay up 20 RMB to the company. Ah, yes. there you go. Really so, yeah. The yeah. fact is, though, in a way, we're penalizing ourselves by taking our cars into cities because yeah. we're stuck in traffic, we're stuck in congestion, mm. and we're breathing really filthy air. And it's killing people. The WHO are talking about 7 million deaths from air pollution. Yeah. Work that we've just seen talks about 50, 60,000 in Europe alone just because of excess yeah. knocks from vehicles. Yeah. So it's, it's about us all understanding the roles we play. We're not drivers, we're pedestrians too. Yeah. So yeah. look at the bigger picture. Yeah, mm. yeah. so many people uh, are talking more about closing down the center of cities mm. to, to, ca to the only the most necessary uh, vehicles. Yeah, vehicles um, yeah. Excellent. There was one other Twitter question that came in the other day I want us to get back to, but there's also a question from the audience. So let's take that next. Thank you. Bernard Ensing from European Cyclist Federation and the World Cycling Alliance, just on China. What can we expect for the next 10 years about cycling in China? Will it take off again, or what do you think? So, uh, could you understand that? It was about cycling in China. What do you expect in the next 10 years for it to take, to, to increase or not? What do you expect uh, for trends in China on cycling? Um, for in the last uh, probably 20 years, uh, the bike riding had been declining uh, very sharply, for example, in 1980, in the 1980s, Beijing probably has about uh, um, more than 50% of people cycling. And uh, nowadays, um, before the end of last year, was uh, probably 11% on mold share was the drop was very sharp. And uh, nowadays what we are doing is to first uh, to provide, because uh, during the past we had uh, gave more priority to the cars. And the car pays nothing and uh, they get uh, the most right of way. So first we start with a more uh, bicycle friendly street and uh, also uh, giving the, in the incentive uh, for uh, bike riding. And also nowadays, you probably know about the uh, dockless, uh, dockless uh, bike sharing. Um, with this uh, alone, this is uh, from the society, not by the government. Uh, this alone in this one year will probably increase the two to three percent in bike sharing. So in a lot of cities, uh, automobile purchasing is still at the peak. Um, the bike share might uh, still drop. So nowadays we balance between the, um, uh, uh, between the public transit, because public transit share is also increasing. So now a lot of cities talk about uh, the total green transportation share uh, a lot of people make the goals, uh, such as in Beijing, uh, the goal is 75% by green transportation. Excellent. So, which is pretty high. Pretty Excellent. high. A Excellent. lot of the cities do this. Excellent. Um, China is really stepping um, up as a, as a leader in so many areas. It's fantastic. Um, the last Twitter question was by Hano. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do the other uh, Twitter question. Um, yeah, shaking heads. But uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll have to save it for another evening. Um, I want to thank all of our amazing guests. Uh, do keep the questions coming in on hashtag we are transport. Thanks to uh, DHL for hosting us here at Post Tower. And um, uh, next we are, tonight's Friday. We have the next two off, but we're going to have live streaming again next week with some great sequence of um, talk shows, amazing guests on celebrating transport and the future of transport, commitments around transport, urban transport, and uh, really great guests. So please do join us next week and uh, share, the, share the Twitter. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank